Have you ever met a lazy person? Have you ever been frustrated that things were just taking too long? Have you ever wanted to tell a judge, do your job? Well, have I got a legal filing for you? That's right. Anytime you don't get your way fast enough, just get the appeals court to tell your judge to do his job. And how? And here to show us how it's done, it's none other than your favorite accidental live streamer, Acer Thorn! Hello everyone, hello, I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney, and today I'll be standing in for the part of David Stebbins, otherwise known as Acer Thorn, in the acceptance of this honor of law splaining the recent petition for writ of mandamus and writs of prohibition filed by Mr. Stebbins in the Polano matter. Reminder that this is the case where Mr. Stebbins has accused the defendants of infringing his accidental live stream, a broadcast that somehow started without Mr. Stebbins' input and allegedly was shared without Mr. Stebbins' permission and without a fair use exception. The case has wound its way through the Federal District Court for the Northern District of California over the past year, so far culminating in Google's filing of a failed motion to dismiss because Mr. Stebbins voluntarily dismissed the Google parties 20 minutes before they filed their own motion to dismiss. Mr. Stebbins has filed multiple motions, including some characterized as emergency motions that maybe weren't arguably emergencies, and it has gotten the attention of the judge. The judge has accused Mr. Stebbins of gamesmanship and admonished him to stick to permitted filings and the following of legal procedure. But look, look who's back. The Google parties filed a motion to intervene about a week after they were dismissed from the lawsuit. And ever since then, Mr. Stebbins has been filing increasingly anxious papers with the court, filings which seem to reveal or project his mental state onto the docket for all to read. So now Mr. Stebbins is defending from the Google Party's offense of a motion to intervene, which will likely be followed by another motion to dismiss style dispositive filing pointing out that accidental live streams are probably not copyright protected because they did not originate with a human author because they are accidental. I made a video about the topic, bubble here, if you are interested in hearing more. Because today, we're going to talk about the ancient writ of mandamus. And I want to say a big thank you to Acer Thorn for giving me a reason to make a video about writs of mandamus and Marbury versus Madison and the origins of judicial power in the United States. This goes all the way back to the late 1700s, when the United States was just getting started as a federalized union of member states. For those first couple decades, many of the foundational elements of United States law were created and then tested for the very first time. One of those landmark Supreme Court cases came in 1801, when the country was transferring power between outgoing President John Adams and incoming President Thomas Jefferson. We are fortunate today that we don't know anything about issues with transfers of presidential power. But back then, there were issues because just two days before President Adams' term as president ended, he appointed several dozen Federalist Party supporters to new circuit judge and justice of the peace positions in an attempt to frustrate Jefferson and his supporters in what was then the Democrat-Republican Party. The Senate quickly confirmed Adams' appointments, but the outgoing Secretary of State John Marshall did not deliver all of the new judges' commissions before Adams' departure and Jefferson's subsequent inauguration. Jefferson believed that the undelivered commissions were void and instructed his Secretary of State, James Madison, not to deliver them. One of the undelivered commissions belonged to William Marbury, a Maryland businessman who had been a strong supporter of Adams and the Federalists. Marbury filed a lawsuit with the Supreme Court asking the court to issue an order, a writ of mandamus, forcing Madison to deliver his commission. In ruling that Madison's refusal to deliver Marbury's commission was illegal, but that the court had no jurisdiction over types of cases like Marbury's, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to issue the writ of mandamus. This was the first time the court had used its power of judicial review to strike down a law. 
This case, Marbury versus Madison, a decision made in 1803, established that the U.S. Constitution gives courts the power to refuse to give any effect to congressional legislation that is inconsistent with the court's interpretation of the Constitution, even if the Constitution doesn't explicitly say courts can strike down laws. So it is no small matter for Acerthorn to invoke the very laws that established the power of judicial review, the power of the courts to order people to do things or decide that laws are invalid. And nor is it a small thing for Acerthorn to make his request in the way that he's done it. So without further ado, let's take a look at what Mr. Stebbins has filed now. First, Mr. Stebbins filed a notice of his application for his writs of mandamus and prohibition on the docket of the district court telling the district court that he is asking for these writs from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Then Mr. Stebbins filed the petition for the writs with both the district court and the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. I did verify that he actually did file the appeal with the appeals court, making an in forma pauperous motion there as well. That's worth noting because IFP motions often give courts an extra way out of the case, allowing the court to potentially scrutinize the case a little more than in non-IFP cases. So he starts his petition with a caption and then a table of contents with statutes and rules and case law all broken out in very much the way attorneys do when they file their briefs. It's worth noting that it appears Mr. Stebbins is trying very hard to follow the law and procedure and formatting required to file things with the court. He starts the substance of his petition with some signposting. He's seeking a writ of mandamus, ordering the Honorable Judge Jeffrey White to pass judgment on all pending motions in the case of Stebbins v. Polano, including and especially the motion for a default judgment. He also asks the appeals court to force Judge White to deny the Google Party's motion to intervene. Next, he will ask for two writs of prohibition, the first ordering the court, the lower court, not to consider any of the arguments raised in the frivolous motion to intervene when ruling on the motion for a default judgment. Remember, that's the Google Party's motion to intervene and Mr. Stebbins' motion for a default judgment. And he wants Judge White not to perform any adverse actions against me that are motivated in whole or in part by my filing of the notice of voluntary dismissal. So far, this is more or less how you would write a request to the court. What's lacking here is not the formatting, in my opinion, but I'll react to the substance when we get there. He has an issues presented section. His first issue is whether the district court has taken an unreasonably long time to issue a ruling on the motion to intervene. Second, whether the binding precedent unequivocally requires the district court to deny the motion to intervene solely on the grounds that granting it would violate the plaintiff's absolute right to a voluntary dismissal. Third, whether the district court should be allowed to consider sua sponte or on its own the arguments raised by the interveners on a motion for a default judgment. And fourth or D, whether the district court should be prohibited from taking any adverse action against me for the lawful exercise of my absolute right to a voluntary dismissal vis-a-vis -vis the arguments raised in the motion to intervene. It sounds like he's a little bit worried about the judge ruling against him. He goes into the facts of the case. He says, the biggest reason why I cared about filing this lawsuit was because Polano was leading the charge in an online hate campaign against me, harassing and doxing me, and encouraging and recruiting others to do the same. By obtaining an injunction ordering him to cease and desist, I am hoping to put a stop to the harassment. Now, part of the problem here is that David Stebbins has not successfully moved for an injunction. He already made two injunction requests which were denied. I don't know if there was a third request for an injunction. Copyright is not meant to be used to stop harassment and doxing. Don't get me wrong, those are legally recognized wrongs that could be addressed in the right court with the right argument, but copyright is used to promote the sciences and the useful arts for the life of the author plus 70 years. Not to obtain injunctions against harassment and doxing. Stebbins goes a little further into the details of the case procedure and the facts. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. 
On April 20th, YouTube and Alphabet tried to circumvent the voluntary dismissal by filing a motion to intervene. It was obvious that this was nothing more than a transparent attempt to circumscribe the voluntary dismissal. My concern here is that Mr. Stebbins may not understand how the voluntary dismissal interacts with the motion to intervene. Uh, to be fair, it is unusual to have a party dismissed from a case and then immediately turn around and try to get back in via a motion to intervene. But my understanding of the legal procedure here is that those are two separate procedural remedies that are available under the federal rules. In other words, the voluntary dismissal and the intervention are separate and will be handled separately. If Mr. Stebbins dismissed the Google parties, then they were dismissed and their motion to dismiss was stricken from the record. Then we can put a period on that sentence and put that in a box and move on to the next issue. The next issue, of course, is that Google then filed a motion to intervene. So then I think you start over in your analysis and see if the moving party meets the burden for the motion to intervene. And we know that Mr. Stebbins is still interested in pursuing something against YouTube or Alphabet or Google or Facebook or Amazon. So Google thinks that's enough to keep the case alive as to them and allow their efforts to put the court on notice of the copyright issues with the accidental live stream. Because of the pending motion to intervene, the court canceled the hearing for the motion for default judgment and failed to set any new hearing date for that motion. Thus, even if the motion to intervene is eventually denied, the interveners still caused the very delay that the voluntary dismissal was meant to prevent. This makes for a total of five motions that are sitting on the docket waiting for a ruling, and he lists them out. The motion to intervene, the motion for default judgment, the third amended complaint, the motion for sanctions, and a motion to clarify. He says, there is also the fact that the aforementioned harassment and doxing is still ongoing for as long as the case remains without a judgment. Were it not for the motion to intervene, I would have obtained a judgment by now, which would have put a stop to the harassment. But the motion to intervene is preventing the judgment from issuing, which in turn is keeping the harassment going and even amplifying. He seems awfully sure that he would have had his desired outcome by now, but for the motion to intervene. I do not concur. Mr. Stebbinson goes into his argument on each of the writs. On the writ of mandamus, he says, it is well established that one of the most common grounds for granting a writ of mandamus is to compel a court to issue a ruling on a motion that has sat on its docket for an unreasonable amount of time. He then quotes the rules for a writ of mandamus. A, the district court must have a duty to act. B, if so, did the district court engage in unreasonable delay in discharging this duty? C, whether the judge is required specifically to deny the motion to intervene. Dear viewer, it is at this time in my reading of Mr. Stebbins' petition that I did something quite unusual for someone in my position. I'm ashamed to say that I, I did not trust Mr. Stebbins' recitation of the rules surrounding the issuing of a writ of mandamus, so I thought I would check up on his research. In Allied Chemical Corp. v. Diflon, Inc., the Supreme Court invalidated a writ of mandamus which overturned a lower court's verdict, saying, quote, This court has recognized that the writ of mandamus has traditionally been used in the federal courts only to confine an inferior court to a lawful exercise of its prescribed jurisdiction, or to compel it to exercise its authority when it is in its duty to do so. Only exceptional circumstances, amounting to a judicial usurpation of power, will justify the invocation of this extraordinary remedy. The court gave two short examples. In State X. Rel. Haas v. Schwaba, the Supreme Court affirmed a circuit court's writ of mandamus directing the defendant district court judge to reinstate a verdict of guilty which he had purported to set aside after granting a post-verdict sua sponte judgment of acquittal. The Supreme Court issued a comparable writ in State X. Rel. Redden v. Davis in 1980 when the defendant circuit court judge had dismissed an indictment on the basis of evidentiary insufficiency after the verdict of guilty was received and filed. In both cases, the defendants had followed procedures that exceeded their authority, and that was the principal basis for the Supreme Court's holdings. See also Mallard v. U.S. District Court. 
Mallard was a new attorney recently admitted to practice. The court selected him to represent indigent inmates in a civil rights lawsuit against prison officials. He informed the court in a motion to withdraw that he was not competent to represent the inmates in their civil rights suit as a fresh new attorney. But the court refused his withdrawal. He appealed for a writ of mandamus to compel the district court to allow his withdrawal. The Supreme Court ruled that the law does not authorize a federal court to require an unwilling attorney to represent an indigent litigant in a civil case, and that Mallard had met his burden of proof that he was entitled to a writ of mandamus because the district court had plainly acted beyond its authorized power or jurisdiction. Because Mallard had no alternative remedy available to him, the Supreme Court issued the writ and Mallard was allowed out of the case. Contrast that with Acerthorne's case. One of the biggest factors against the issuance of a writ of mandamus is that alternate remedies are available. In Mr. Stebbins' case, he's waited two months for the judge to rule on the motion to intervene. Mr. Stebbins has admitted that the court has five motions to consider and rule on. And Mr. Stebbins has already been admonished for excessive filings that don't follow procedure or substance or formatting properly. One of the most basic alternatives available in Mr. Stebbins' case currently is just wait longer. I've sometimes waited six months for a ruling on a complicated motion. With a little more knowledge on writs of mandamus, let's return to Mr. Stebbins' filing. He says, The motion to intervene is at odds with the voluntary dismissal of those same parties, the Google parties, the two filings are entirely irreconcilable. One simply has to be cast out in favor of the other. The only question is, which one? That is not even a question, he says. The two filings are entirely in different leagues in terms of how courts are supposed to deal with them. In fact, it is so discretionary that, absent an affirmative right to intervene, which is not being alleged here, an order denying leave to intervene is not even ordinarily appealable. There's a lot to unpack here. I've said before that I do not believe that the voluntary dismissal and motion to intervene are entirely irreconcilable. The court has already noticed and admonished Mr. Stebbins for his procedural gamesmanship. Courts don't like procedural gamesmanship. Courts and judges want parties to win cases on the merits, not on procedural technicalities or via procedural gamesmanship. So the court will likely want to consider Mr. Stebbins' behavior when it is reconciling why a voluntarily dismissed party would be trying to get back into the case via a motion to intervene. Mr. Stebbins' conclusory language in paragraphs 15 and 16 is not the way you should ever talk to a judge. The district court judge will not appreciate that. The appeals court judge will not appreciate that. It's very possible that any leeway the courts had to possibly rule in your favor could go right out the door if the judge also has the leeway to rule against you. Mr. Stebbins goes on. A court has no discretion to exercise once a Rule 41 dismissal is filed. Hi, I'm back already. So that might be true as to the Rule 41 dismissal. Once that dismissal is closed, the judge could obtain discretion through the other rules. The no discretion language surrounding voluntary dismissals means the court has no discretion to deny the voluntary dismissal. And the court recognized that lack of discretion in Mr. Stebbins' case. And Mr. Stebbins got those parties dismissed. And they are currently dismissed. What he's upset about is that they are trying to get back in now, of course. So he would need to address the rules surrounding the intervention more and focus on the voluntary dismissal less. Again, hypothetically speaking, not legal advice. Mr. Stebbins goes on to conclude that because of how cut and dry the case is, any delay other than a few days after the normal hearing date is necessarily undue for the purposes of requiring a writ of mandamus. I think he's wrong about that. We'll get to see what the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals has to say there. He tries to address the lack of alternate methods of obtaining the relief he seeks, he simply concludes that in the instant case, no adequate alternate remedy is available. He then claims that his case is a Capone case. 
Just like how Al Capone was officially charged with tax evasion, but the main purpose of charging him was to get a mob boss off the streets by any means necessary. This, too, is a lawsuit that officially is filed for one reason, copyright infringement, but is primarily designed for another purpose, to stop harassment and doxing. Therefore, it is a Capone case, a case officially filed for one thing, but which serves a different purpose in addition to the official thing. Acer Thorne seems to have admitted that he filed the case to stop harassment and doxing and is only using the law of copyright as a vehicle to get there. Certainly, there is one level of using the law to get your way, and that is permitted. But there's also a line where filing a case for an improper purpose becomes illegal. My current opinion is that this admission will help undo Acer Thorne's case. Filing a copyright case so that you don't have to file a harassment case in the proper court is probably some level of illegal or improper. And I'm looking forward to seeing if the Ninth Circuit or District Court Judge White addresses that in their next rulings. Okay, almost done. Acer Thorne next asks for his writs of prohibition, the first one for an order compelling the District Court not to consider the arguments contained in the motions to intervene or dismiss. Stebbins uses the future tense when he speculates about Judge White considering facts or legal arguments made by the Google parties. That alone is probably enough for the judge to deny the request. Courts don't grant orders for speculative or uncertain future harms. This is the ripeness doctrine. The case or controversy must be ripe for judicial review. The same judicial review we talked about with Marbury versus Madison. A claim is not ripe if it rests upon contingent future events that may not occur as anticipated or indeed may not occur at all. So Stebbins' first request for a writ of prohibition will probably be denied as Judge White hasn't ruled in the way that Stebbins is worried about. And that's forgetting that Stebbins probably doesn't have any legal remedy just because the judge didn't rule in his favor. Writ of prohibition number two wants an order compelling the district court not to engage in any adverse action against Stebbins' petitioner because of the voluntary dismissal. So it's very similar to the writ of prohibition number one. Mr. Stebbins is very concerned that the judge now heard the arguments against copyrightability and will rule against copyrightability. And Mr. Stebbins is doing everything he can to try and stop that. But like I said before, courts like to adjudicate things on the merits so it will be very hard for him to keep meritorious legal arguments out of his case. I'm going to guess that he thought he had won. Kind of like Akila Hughes, he thought he had won a default judgment, and it was just a matter of time, and now it's taking more time, and the threads are starting to come undone, and his argument is starting to come undone, and he's afraid that the judge has figured out the game that he is playing, and that the mistake that Mr. Stebbins may have perpetrated on the court the mistake of the accidental live stream not being copyrightable. Mr. Stebbins finally concludes, the district court has blatantly overstepped its authority by threatening to punish me for the exercise of this absolute right. It is engaging in undue delay by failing to pass judgment on a cut and dry issue in which it has no discretion, simply because it does not, by its own admission, believe the law should favor me. Therefore, a writ of mandamus is necessary to put an end to the undue delay, to stop the interveners from attempting to circumscribe that which cannot be circumscribed. And writs of prohibition are necessary to stop the district court from retaliating against me for abusing that which cannot be abused. Okay, yeah, there's a lot here. First, a district court ruling against you because you don't have a meritorious case is not punishment. That's just the operation of the law on the facts. Likewise, it is not engaging in undue delay for the judge to take two months or more to respond to the complicated motion to intervene. The issue is not as cut and dry as Mr. Stebbins claims that it is. And as to his claim that you cannot abuse the law, I would simply point to the law that says, don't abuse the law. The law which requires unreasonable or vexatious litigants to satisfy personally the excess costs, expenses, and attorney's fees reasonably incurred because of their misconduct. This law could not exist if it was impossible to abuse the law. So that was filed with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on Monday, June 27th, 
along with an informal pauperous petition to waive the appellate court fees. What happens next could be a ruling from the appeals court that the appeal is deficient, or maybe the appeal is denied, or maybe the Google parties will try to respond in the appeals court as well. I'll be watching the dockets closely to bring you an update on what happens next. What do you think of Stebbins' attempts to use the law this way to his advantage? Do you think he is engaging in gamesmanship of the illegal or disallowed kind? Or do you think he is simply being a smart player of the game using every move and opportunity to gain an advantage over his opponent? Let me know what you think of Mr. Stebbins' case, his appeal for writs of mandamus and prohibition, and the argument that his accidental live stream is simply not copyrightable. Thanks for watching! Special thanks to my top supporters in June John Steele, Evie, Spirit Bear, Benjamin Hytov, Ugly Grill, Torpedon, Shadow Tycho, Gut Broge, Pure Magma, Eric Tams, Tech Tech Potato, The Blood Soaked Survivors, Wyatt Calandro, and King Ares. You can support Lawful Masses on Patreon.com slash LJ French, Sponsus.com slash Law, through YouTube memberships, and through Floatplane subscriptions. Join me for our weekly live production stream on twitch.tv slash lawful masses on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. Eastern U.S. time. I hope everyone has a great week. I love you all. Bye.